Uh, as some of you may already know me, I'm Nadia and I will be hosting today's session with uh, Gabriel and Don. And by the way, Gabriel is with us today from Brazil. A very special welcome to our today's speaker, Nicholas Pitlosier from University of British Columbia. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for agreeing to give a talk at CCG. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, Nicholas is uh, finishing his uh, PhD research at the University, <laughs> University of Columbia in uh, Okanagan, if I'm pronouncing correctly, where he is investigating the contribution of involved shear zone uh, formation and reactivation to the architecture accretionary originals. He recently completed a research at, a study at the University of Halle Wittenberg in Germany and will present his finding there for today's talk. You go ahead, Nicholas. Thank you. Thanks, Nadia. Uh, thanks for inviting me to. Um, Our pleasure. Okay, <laughs> I can't change my slide. Okay, good. So um, I think by now it's fairly well accepted that shear zones and fault zones are excellent fluids for, uh, sorry, excellent con conduits for fluid. We could be talking about surface fluid, such as seawater percolating down a uh, fold zone and into shear zones. This guy's talking mainly about fluids and shear zones, Chris, if you're at all interested. <laughs> yeah, and um, so, and we could also be talking about metamorphic fluids or metasomatic fluids that would uh, climb up into shear zone because of differential pressure. Um, I think it's also very well accepted that fluid rock interaction, especially with a metastable host rock, will lead to mineralogical changes that would affect the rheology of the host rock and thus the evolution of a shear zone. So I included here two pictures that I stole from a paper from uh, Pinacchioli and Mantello from the Torn window in Italy, where we see such example. On the left side, we have an uh, unaltered granitoid protolith where we have the development of a nice little shear band. Well, on the right side, we have an epidote van with the selvage uh, that are a little bit uh, bleached. And we see that the shear zone is developing at the interface between the unaltered and altered protolith. So when we have perfect exposure, such as this field location, where it's literally um, multiple square kilometers of, of uh, deglaciated terrain, uh, it's very easy to link uh, field observation of uh, mineral mineralogical changes to rheological changes. But the trouble is when we step out and we look at a, uh, a, a regional shear zone where perhaps the um, field exposure is not as great, such as what we deal with in the Canadian Appalachian, it's very hard to um, look uh, across multiple outcrops and make the same type of field observation. We don't have, we usually don't have such good field observation to relate um, uh, metasomatism and shear zone rheology. So the Canadian Appalachian is interesting on its own. It's an accretionary origin, meaning that during the convergence of Laurentia and Gondwana, we recorded at least four major deformation events or tectonic events until the final continent-continent collision. Um, the Canadian portion of the Appalachian escaped that final continent-continent collision, so it keeps a lot of characteristics that are typical of accretionary origins. So I'm talking of multiple shear zones and a lot of uh, long-lived shear zones that were reactivated multiple times. So part of my project has been to understand why, uh, how shear zone reactivation or activation in board of the main suture zone may lead to uh, or facilitate the emplacement of magma-related deposits. So for today, I'll just focus on the latest deformation event or collisional event, the Neocadian origin, which involves the microcontinent left side of the map uh, with uh, the composite margin of Laurentia with Gandaria and Avalonia, which are two other microcontinents that were previously accreted on the margin of Laurentia. So the suture zone of that um, collision, uh, collision is the Kubikwid Shedabukto shear zone, here colored in orange, CCSD. Um, and during the Neocadian origin, so during the deformation of the Kubikwid Shedabukto shear zone, both the Eastern Island shear zone EHSZ and the Pokologan Kinebekesis shear zone on the upper left were either activated or reactivated. Uh, one of the questions that I'm trying to answer today in the Pokologan Kinebekesis shear zone, so where I put a little red star, is how the metasomatic alteration may have 
contributed or affected the development of the shear zone. Of course, uh, from now, it looks a little bit out of nowhere. Uh, this research question actually stems out of field observation. So to set up the talk today, and I will first present up the observation that support this hypothesis. Then I'll show the mineral assemblages that are part, uh, I think are part of that metathematic uh, alteration. And then we'll test that hypothesis. So are, are these mineral assemblages the result of the alteration of the protolith? Maybe it's just different protolith or simply the result of uh, a metamorphic gradient. Once we've tested that question, uh, I'll show how I quantified the fabric evolution. And finally, we'll discuss the possible deformation mechanism that may explain, uh, that, that may have um, be impacted by a metasomatism. So the Pokologan Kinvakesi shear zone formed at the interface between the Pokologan metamorphic suite here in dark red and the Pokologan harbor granitoid belt. The Pokologan metamorphic suite is a sliver of metamorphic rock that formed from, uh, that is thought to have formed uh, from the Kingston Nice. The Kingston Nice is um, a volcanic arc. It has uh, a few uh, English uh, intrusive and extrusive rocks and also a little bit of a metasedimentary rocks. While the Pokanogan Harbor granitoid belt is mostly a northernized belt uh, of felsic to intermediate recomposition. And the rock of the Pokanogan Harbor granitoid belt are thought to have formed in the same um, magmatic environment. The main fabric uh, associated to the Pokanogan uh, Kinebekesis shear zone is uh, steep and the mineral lineation is sub horizontal. And when we move out of the shear zone into the Kingston knife, the fabric is still steep, but the mineral lineation is much more variable. It's generally horizontal at the interface to the, with the shear zone, but as we move inside the Kingston knife, it, it, it's often uh, sub vertical. However, when we move on to the coast on the Pokalagan Harbor uh, granitoid belt, the foliation actually becomes a little bit more shallow. And it's thought to be a primary feature of the shear zone. So here I've included three cross section A, B, and C that move progressively toward the coast. And I've included field pictures that sort of support those cross sections. And one interesting feature that we see better on the field picture is that the foliation is also folded, forms open folds. And I'll come to back to that later in the discussion. Now I'll show some picture, a field picture of uh, the fabric evolution. Um, here's a quartz diorite where the foliation is marked by biotite. And on the same outcrop, we see a um, little shear band still marked by biotite. And if you move into the higher strain zone of that same outcrop again, and I'll just on the upper left, there's a, a cartoon where we see the location of these outcrop with respect to the Pokalagan and Makisi shear zone. And I'll keep that cartoon here every time I, uh, I show an outcrop or a thin section. And if we move to the higher strain portion of, the, of that similar, same outcrop, the C, C prime fabric is still marked by biotite, but um, I, there's bands of pale green uh, mineral uh, that I actually didn't notice when, when I did the field work. And actually, uh, I came back to my field picture once I looked at its infection, and I think that those little bands are marked by muscovite, which is somewhat odd. And, uh, this is where the idea that, okay, maybe there's a little bit of fluid rock interaction here that is involved in the development of that muscovite fabric. So this is where this, this hypothesis comes from. Now, if we move um, to the map location of the Pokalagian Kinebekis, the shear zone, the protolith is almost indistinguishable. We still see some large or some, uh, some plagiocytes in a crisp, but if you walk in onto that outcrop without seeing the rest of the Pokalagian harbor, granitoid belt, you, you, you wouldn't recognize that as a, as a granitoid part of it. So I've, I've hinted at the fact that I think there are different mineral assemblages uh, related to the shear fabric. And now I'll, I'll quickly cover them by looking at the tin section. I'll give you a spoiler alert here. I think there are three different mineral zones. So we'll go through each of them and I'll keep track of those assemblages onto our AKF diagram here. But before we do that, uh, let's introduce um, some of the methods that I've used. Um, I've scanned the infection with the micro XRF. Um, basically, I can get the chemistry out of it. And then I classified the mineralogy out of the individual infection map 
of an individual element. So I've taken the main poles of the metamorphic ternary ter diagrams, so iron, potassium, potassium, aluminium, calcium, and, uh, and magnesium. And, and then I performed the Gaussian noise reduction and I created a composite RGB image with the iron, potassium, and aluminium poles. So iron is red, potassium is green, aluminium is blue. And that gives me, because of my mineral assemblage, it gives me just a, a good idea of what mineral is present in my thin section. I'm gonna use a k-mean clustering algorithm to class sort my mineralogy. That's semi-automated, but it's also dependent of the user input. So I used my composite image on the left to make sure I did a good job with the classification. And of course, we're losing some of the accessory minerals. So on the thin section on the left, you see that they have some little red dots. Those are magnetite grains, but I couldn't, I couldn't actually pick that up uh, with a semi-automated uh, clustering algorithm. But I think for the purpose of our research, where we're interested in strain bearing phases, we actually care mostly about um, principal, principal minerals. Okay, now we look again at the quartz diorite. We have a least deformed portion of the outcrop, but we still see the foliation nearby the Sharpie. And in thin section, we see again, CS fabric and scaling it up to the right kinematic or strike with dextral uh, kinematics onto the outcrop. That shear fabric, if we look at the chemistry, is marked by biotite and chloride grains, uh, which are brown and purple, respectively. And um, we see a little bit of zoisite grains that are re replacing some uh, igneous, uh, igneous, probably terracines, but it, it was hard to identify them on the section. And most interestingly, um, the quartz aggregate bands in black are not continuous. Um, uh, while the fine grain assemblages of plagioclase, quartz, and uh, well, and muscovite uh, are continuous and, and, and parallel to the shear band. So we can see that here with a thin section picture where we see again a quartz aggregate with oblate grain boundaries, which indicate that there's probably bulging dynamic recrystallization. Those quartz aggregate form almost a, a boudin or a sigma class, and they're surrounded by a fine grain matrix of plagioclase being cerocytized, so a little bit of muscovite, and fine grain quartz, uh, which is uh, interesting, and we'll come back to that later. And if we ignore the cerocyte because it's a reaction, and we consider the assemblage of being um, chloride, biotite, uh, maybe a little bit of magnetite and zoisite on the AKF diagram projecting in the third dimension toward the calcium pole, we get the assemblage on the green assemblage here on the left. Moving on to uh, same mythology, different outcrop, again, a quartz diorite. In thin section, the fabric is also marked by mica, where we have CS fabric with a top to the right kinematics. And most interestingly, now when we look at the chemistry and, and the thin section, we see that the CS fabric is also defined by muscovite. And so we, now we start seeing in thin section the same pattern uh, we could see on the field pictures where the foliation becomes more, uh, is, uh, the mineral marking the foliation is, is, uh, is muscovite, different than what we saw previously, which again is a little bit surprising. And interestingly, again, um, the quartz aggregate form boudin or small clumps, they're not continuous, while the fine grain, uh, plagioclase, uh, muscovite, and quartz. And matrix form continuous aggregate. Now, if we talk about the texture with the quartz aggregate, we see that the grain boundary is oblique with respect to the main foliation, and we still see oblate boundaries, which indicates that we probably have a combination of subgrain rotation recrystallization and bulging dynamic recrystallization. And again, this mineral assemblage now has muscovite, so it's different than what we see previously. So on the AKF diagram, we're probably in the blue or green field on the left. Moving on to our third outcrop, uh, the protolith is a little bit harder to distinguish here, some sort of grain to it. It's cross-cut by numerous quartz veins. And if we look in between the quartz vein and we pick up uh, the most uh, deformed specimen, the shear fabric here with a C prime uh, oblique shear band still indicates a top to the right kinematic or textural strike fit on the outcrop and it's entirely marked by muscovite. Um, but now we start seeing a little bit more potassium feldspar, 
and a little bit of calcite precipitating in between the um, in between the fragments of the feldspar. Again, a fine grain aggregate of plagioclase, quartz, and muscovite are continuous and parallel to the shear band, which is also important rheologically. Our assemblage is potassium feldspar and muscovite with plus in a different AKF diagram, probably on the gray field here on the left. And then finally, we look at, look at our last salt trap located at the map location of the Potelganti in the case of shear zone. And here, the protolith is just impossible to distinguish fine grain with a strong foliation. When we look at it on this section, the foliation is still marked by muscovite. We still have D prime shear bands indicating at sub to the right kinematics. But most interestingly, um, potassium sulfur is precipitating in between uh, fragments of plagioclase, uh, which indicates that if this is actually metasomatism or an alteration of the protolith, it was synchronous to, uh, to the, it occurred at the same time than the deformation. Moving on to the thin section picture, we see oblique um, subbrain boundary in the quartz aggregate, which indicates that the quartz probably deformed in subbrain uh, rotation recrystallization. And now it's important just to mention that, okay, I've described a combination of bulging and some grand rotation recrystallization or either mechanism individually. Uh, and that was true for the whole shear zone. I, I couldn't relate either the mineral assemblage to the quartz deformation mechanism. It was sort of unpredictable. And I think that's important to the story as well. And again, uh, the self bar are being sericitized. So um, we've noticed that we have three different mineral assemblages. Uh, we don't know why we have those assemblages. It could be three, dif it could be three different protolites. It could be just a normal retrograde or prograde evolution of the shear zone, or it could be metasomatic uh, operation. And if we didn't have that, those field uh, evidences uh, of where we saw the assemblage evolving from um, a biotite, a, 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 a shear fabric dominated by biotite or shear fabric dominated by muscovite on the same outcrop, it would be a little bit hard to distinguish. But still, I think it's important to address this question quantitatively by um, evaluating what is the, evaluating uh, it, how far we're deviating from a typical protolith if we're deviating from a typical protolith. So here I've colored, I've colored the specimen from the Potelagan Harbor granitoid belt with respect to their mineral assemblage. And I'll keep that cartoon again for the next slide so we know what we're talking about. And I've only selected those specimens because I hope that they're part of, that they have this a similar protolith. And to have a better control on the protolith, I took the data from a paper from Chris White in 2002 and I've located these outcrops uh, with X's on, uh, on the cartoon. And for this study, Chris uh, characterized the evolution, the, the magmatic evolution of the granitoid belt. So I'm hoping to use that as a least altered protolith so I can compare the chemistry of my deformed specimen with respect to his chemistry. And now there's an important disclaimer here. I've used the whole rock chemistry from the micro XOS map, which is good to plus or minus two weight percent. So I've ignored all the trace element, the rarity element, which would usually be essential for characterizing hydrothermal alteration. And, uh, and then I, I, and so I'm, I'm only dealing with major elements here. So it makes, it makes the story a little bit harder to, um, to, uh, to deal with if you're looking only at chemical data and you're ignoring field evidences. So for the next slide, I'll keep the data of Chris White as a reference point to the precedent. Um, so the first way to sort of generally clean up data and look at, look at the broad pattern is to compare all the major elements to the least mobile element. So in our case, since we're ignoring rare elements, uh, I chose titanium as the least mobile element. And basically, we can see how our specimens are deviating from the reference specimen from Chris White, so the specimen in black. So we want to see how the colored dots uh, move with respect to the data from Chris White. Um, I'll show you a little cartoon here to see how that we deal with those uh, plots. So the problem with uh, mobility diagram is that we're dealing uh, 
we have a, a closure constraint. So all the data must add up to 100 weight percent. And that's a problem if you're looking, if you're trying to uh, interpret if some, if some elements were either leached or enriched, because you have either a dilution or enrichment effect on the immobile element. So for example, if you have a basket of fruit uh, with apple and oranges, and you add apples to the basket of fruit, you'll have the impression that you have less oranges with, with respect to the total fruit at the end. And so you'd think that the oranges were uh, eaten, but it's actually wrong. It's just because of the closure effect. They were just diluted with respect to the total amount of fruit. So if we're looking at our reference data here, it would be that black line. Um, and every mobile element that would be added to the composition uh, to the hydrothermal assemblage would move up with respect to our initial pattern. And any element that would be depleted would move down to the right, while the elements that were immobile but enriched or diluted would stay parallel to our initial trend. So if we overlay that interpretation on top of our initial graphs, we can say generally that, okay, there's more sil silicon, there's more sodium, there are more, there's more potassium, but again, we need to treat that with care. And on the lower right, uh, you'll notice that uh, phosphorus is, is almost no, and that's a, an effect of the method we've used um, because the most of phosphate is inside um, apatite and phosphate, phosphate accessory uh, minerals, and they are generally smaller than our pixel size. Uh, they were not picked up by the micro XRF scan. So it it's not an indication that phosphate was mobile. It's just a, it's just a part of using micro XRF for, for rough data. Okay, so there's quite a bit of difference between our data and the reference data of Chris White. But it could still be uh, just a third protolith or a different protolith that was, that was not identified before. So we want to know if our chemical range is normal for igneous protolith. So I've used um, an alter alteration box plot from large, where we compare the alteration index of Ishikawa with the chloride carbonate pyrite index. Uh, with respect to an expected range for igneous protolith. So that box here in the middle is just the expected range for uh, mafic to felsic igneous protolith. So the mafic protolith would plot higher up in the box and the felsic protolith would plot lower in the box. And those alteration indexes are usually used for VMS deposits. Uh, so all the data that would plot on the upper right of our graph outside of the box would be a uh, would be a um, specimen that recorded hydrothermal alteration related to VMS deposits. Well, the specimen that plot low and outside the box uh, recorded, according to large, diagenetic alteration. But uh, because we're at higher metamorphic grade, I would call it metasomatic alteration. So first, let's talk about the, our reference data from Chris White. Um, interestingly, uh, the McCarthy point granodiorite, so the black dot. So it's a little bit higher than the penyline granite, uh, which is the gray dot. So we see almost a, a magmatic fractionation pattern there, where the, or simply just the difference between uh, intermediary and felsic protolith inside our protolith range. And now if we look at our different specimen, we see that uh, the specimen with the zoizite biotite assemblage, or muscovite and biotite assemblage, but within that protolith box, while the specimen with a muscovite and potassium feldspar assemblage, but outside that protolith box, so they have a chemical composition that is way outside the expected range for a normal igneous rock. So based on this graph, I say, okay, our chemical range is not normal. It's related to metasomatism, at least for our third assemblage. So that sort of answered the question and support our field observation. Now, I talked about the closure problem with uh, weight percent data. So we want to move out of this and quantify the mass change related to that hydrothermal alteration. So if we pick aluminum and titanium as uh, a reference specimen, um, or a specimen where at least a specimen with a muscovite potassium phosphor assemblage are enriched in sodium and potassium, at least 50%, and uh, in, in silicon, and they were depleted in iron, magnesium, manganese, and calcium. Um, is it significant with respect to the method we've used with respect to micro XRF whole graph data? Yes, it's significant. It's more than the two weight percent data that is um, 
that is part of an uncertainty related to the method. So, okay, that's good. Now we uh, we sorted out that we probably have a metasomatic alteration, but we want to know how it might, might have impacted the fabric evolution of the Pocologan kinobacter shear zone. So we need to quantify um, as many parameters as we can on the shear zone and hopefully parameters that are related to to the mineral, the phase change related to metasomatic alteration. So we'll look at first the preferred orientation of the quartz lattice, and second to the anisotropy of each and all phase that were part of the mineral assemblage. So in specimen where we had uh, quartz aggregates that were somewhat continuous, and we, uh, I selected. Uh, from a micro, uh, sorry, from a fabric analyzer scan, the quartz C-axis orientation of at least a thousand specimens, which I plotted here, and I contoured. You see nice type two cross gear, uh, type one cross girdles, and the central sector of the girdle is often slanted to top to the right, which sort of works with our dextral strike slip kinematic or top to the right kinematics, which indicates that okay, the quartz were, was dynamically recrystallized. That fits with our uh, thin section observation. It's good. How does that relate to the strain gradient of the shear zone? It's a method that is often used to characterize the strain gradient. Yes, we can. Okay, we can quantify the strength of the fabric by just the strength of the uh, of the of the alignment of the quartz C axis, and we see that okay, the, the quartz C axis are pretty well aligned at the map location of the shear zone, but there's a strange peak here where there's one specimen that is much higher than the other ones. And so I just had to look at the thin section to see how that, that, that might look like, what, what would be the texture in thin section. And we come back to our initial picture where we had quartz aggregates surrounded by a fine grain matrix of quartz, phagoplasm, uh, and muscovite, which indicates that these, these forms sort of udines, and so they would be the relatively stronger component of the fabric. So that's an indication. And that's probably explain why the our, our strain gradient defined by the quartz C axis is not is not so well defined because uh, because the rest of the matrix is actually soft They were not they were they were not the the quartz was not the softest mineral in the shear zone. Okay. So what about the other minerals now? Um, so I've mentioned earlier that we have micro scan scans for all of its infection. And from those micro XRF scans, we can create a composite map with all of our uh, important phases. And from those composite maps, we can isolate individual phase maps where we see, for example, in this thin section, there's their plagioclase, uh, uh, palatium sulfur, miscavide, and quartz. And now we can define, we can quantify the anisotropy of each of those individual phases by using an autocorrelation function, ATF. The problem with autocorrelation function is that it's a little bit of a black box. Um, it simply, you simply in, um, feed in a, a binary image with pixels and it feeds out a number related to the anisotropy of that image. So you don't have any control on what you're looking at and what the calculation is doing. It could be actually um, simply calculating the space in between the minerals. Um, so to sort of bypass that problem, we're looking at individual phases so we have a better control on the on the on the on the con contribution of each of those phase to the total asymmetry uh, anisotropy of our thin section. So here's a quick example. On the left, we have all the individual phase for thin section. We have the result of the ACF calculation, and then the the, thresh, the upper ter upper threshold of the ACF calculation outputs an ellipse, and the axis ratio of that ellipse is the number that quantifies the anisotropy of uh, either the total thin section or simply the individual phases. Okay, from just by looking at ellipses, we'd be tempted to call those strain ellipses, but that would be wrong at this stage because we don't know what was the initial shape of those phases and we don't have any control on that. So at this point, it's simply a qualitative indication of the contribution of that phase to the total anisotropy. Um, axis ratio looks a little bit weird because the smaller the axis ratio, the greater the anisotropy. So it's the short over long axis of an ellipse. And so for a circle, which is perfectly isotrope, we'd have an axis ratio of one. And for a very anisotropic ellipse, 
we have a very low access ratio. So for the next slides, I'll reverse the y-axis and I'll put zero as the maximum value so that uh, the higher the data plots onto the graph, the greater the anisotropy of the phase. Um, so the first way to look at this data is simply to plot the field location of the outcrop with, uh, with respect to the map distance to the Potalagan Kinebekesis shear zone. So on the left here, I've highlighted the shear zone in red, and that corresponds to that vertical line here uh, in, our, in our graph. And then the data that plots on the left side of that vertical line is data from the Pokalagan metamorphic suite, while the data plots on the right side of the red line is uh, outcrops from the Pokalagan harbor granitoid belt. So here we have uh, at least, well, we have different protolytes. If we're looking on the left side, we're dealing with multiple protolytes. And if we're looking at the right side, we're dealing with hopefully a somewhat uh, consistent protolyte. Why does it, does it matter? It matters because if you want to make the leap from using the anisotropy data uh, as a qualitative indication of strain to something that looks a little bit more like a strain gradient, you need to make the hypothesis that you're, the protolyte was at least had the same, a similar texture or comparable texture across outcrops. So that's why I'm, I'm a little bit cautious here. If we want to call this um, a strain gradient, we have to consider that, okay, we're looking only at the data on the right side of the protolytic inverticity shear zone because I, they probably had a similar protolyte. Okay, now that we agree on this, we could look at the composite map anisotropy. You see that there is a higher anisotropy nearby the map location of the Pokalagan in like this shear zone. So that's something that looks a little bit like a strain gradient, this. And that similar um, anisotropy gradient is also marked by quartz, plagioclase, and muscovite. Um, so now we want to know, okay, are those phases really contributing to the total anisotropy? So there is a way to do that. It's simply to compare the phase anisotropy phase anisotropy of each individual phase to the total thin section anisotropy. And for example, here with this cartoon, if we're looking at a very anisotropic phase surrounded by a very anisotropic thin section, it would match uh, with the one-to-one -one ratio. The, uh, the anisotropy of phase A would match with the one-to-one -one ratio, the total anisotropy of the thin section. Um, another end member scenario here, if we're looking at a very isotrope mineral, such as a big, um, garnet uh, phenocryst um, surrounded by a very anisotropic matrix, the phase anisotropy at that isotrope mineral, mineral would fall way down the one-to-one -one ratio, way down below the total anisotropy of the thin section. And now the last end number, if we're looking at a um, very anisotropic phase surrounded by anisotropic uh, matrix, the phase anisotropy of that phase would be much higher than the total phase anisotropy of our intersection. So we have to keep that in mind now that we look at, now that we look at the next uh, slide. Okay, so perfect case scenario when we're comparing the composite, the full intersection anisotropy with itself. All the data, of course, falls on the one-to-one -one line, and that's something we want to see here to interpret what is the phase contribution to the total anisotropy. And Again, at least for a muscovite, muscovite, we have a pretty good one-to-one -one match. So we can say that muscovite control, uh, contributes to the total phase anisotropy. And quartz and plagioclase are somewhat a decent match, but they both have that little dip here, uh, which is surprising. So uh, now we need to move out from the data and look at the thin sections again and look at the texture. And I think that this little dip here is an indication of the grind size reduction mechanism. So for example, here in that lower thin section, we have a large plagioclase grains. Uh, well, on the, the upper thin section, which is a little bit more, well, quite, quite a bit more anisotropic, we have sort of a bimodal plagioclase distribution where we still have uh, large grains, but in the matrix is defined by a much more fine plagioclase grain. And I think that explains why the, why the contribution of uh, plagioclase to the total and that we have that little bit that higher strain just reflects the grain, grain size reduction mechanism. Okay, uh, muscovite is also an important mineral. It's the surface 
amongst the ones we've described up to now, at least in, in terms of the minerals that contribute to the total phase anisotropy. So now we can test the hypothesis that more muscovite leads to more uh, thin section anisotropy, so hopefully more strain. Um, and uh, since we have uh, classified thin section maps, so we know the model proportion, we can plot the anisotropy of each phase, the, the, the anisotropy of each phase with respect to its model proportion to see if it contributes to the strain. So if a phase contributes to, if, if more of a phase contributes more of a, to the anisotropy, we'd have sort of a positive slope here, which we see maybe a little bit for the quartz, but certainly for a muscovite, from zero to 10% uh, model proportion, if we only consider uh, quartz, feldspar, and mica, uh, zero to 10% muscovite contributes to phase anisotropy. It increases the axis ratio, but from 10 to at least almost 30%, uh, the, ax the axis ratio of muscovite doesn't really increase, which is, Somewhat surprising. Does that mean that uh, does that mean that muscovite um, either um, either that more muscovite doesn't uh, more muscovite doesn't actually contribute to more strain? Does that mean that muscovite replaces another mineral and takes its phase in entropy, or simply that muscovite um, contributes to a third a second mechanism that actually doesn't create more entropy? And we'll talk about that later. So now we have three metathematic zones, or at least uh, we know which, which specimens are least altered, the specimen in blue, and the specimen that are most altered, the specimen in yellow with the muscovite and potassium sulfur assemblage. We know that our phase aggregate anisotropy is controlled by quartz, plagioclase, and muscovite. And most interestingly, uh, the most altered specimen has equal or less shape aggregate anisotropy than the other specimen. So here on the lower right, of just taking back the the, 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 the cross section of total phase anisotropy with respect to with respect to the mineral assemblage, and we see that the data in blue, uh, at least at the core of the shear zone, the high high anisotropy or high strain portion of the shear zone, plus higher than the data in yellow. If you're looking only at the data inside the Popelagan Harbor granitoid belt, so if you're looking only at a similar and comparable satellite. And this is quite surprising. I was expecting that hydrothermal alteration would actually contribute to more anisotropy uh, by, uh, by allowing fluid to create more mica. Okay, um, so why does mica uh, doesn't really increase the aggregate anisotropy? I've already covered it. Uh, maybe 10% is the just a relatively critical model proportion. Maybe muscovite replaces plagioclase, we've seen that in thin section, and takes up its uh, its shape shape anisotropy, or maybe a muscovite participates to another deformation and mechanism. And I think the answer is actually just a combination of all of those processes. Um, so if we go back to our thin section fabric, I've talked a lot and insisted that we have quite a bit of a fine grain assemblage of plagioclase, quartz, and muscovite, and this assemblage, we need to at least for the pixel size of our micro XIF map, will not contribute a lot to the, the phase that you get in the trophy. Um, so now, what are the deformation mechanisms of the Pokolagan Kinemakitsu Shure Zone? Uh, we have CSD prime fabric development defined by MICA, so it's a little bit of a dislocation tree, but also a little bit of diffusion. Uh, we have quartz dynamic recrystallization, but I've already hinted that it, um, it, it seems um, it, it, it doesn't really mark super well the strain gradient. And finally, we have diffusion creep where we have grain size reduction and granular flow. And that granular flow contributes to phase mixing of a fine aggregate of quartz, sulfur, and muscovite. And I think that these are all important mechanisms in the Pokal again, Kinebeck is this year's own. Coming back to our, and scaling up to the, <laughs> the shear zone scale and the tectonic model. I've taken here a cartoon from uh, Adrian, Park, Adrian Park's paper uh, where we see his interpretation of the geometry of the shear zone, he described it as a least trick uh, dextral strike of shear zone. And I would add to his model that those open folds here that are um, folding the main foliation could actually be related to a trans-tensional extension 
uh, along that strike slip shear zone, um, which I think is very interesting. And on top of that, I think what is actually also interesting is the context in which that type of geometry must have formed. Uh, I think that you need some sort of a back backside shear zone here that we don't see that's underwater. And I'm wondering if the Quebec widget at the two shear zone extends underwater and, uh, nearby the Pocalagan Quebecus shear zone. So here the orange shear zone would extend parallel to the Pocalagan Quebecus shear zone. And if the geometry of the Pocalagan Quebecus shear zone is related uh, to its interaction with the Quebec widget at the two shear zone. And I think that's something uh, we will work on in the nearby future. So in conclusion, the Potolignan Kimbekisi shear zone recorded metasomatic alteration related to more sodium, potassium, and silicon, and less iron, magnesium, manganese. Um, and I think that this metasomatic alteration was either occurred before the deformation or during the dextral strike slip deformation. Um, I've presented a method to characterize deformation of a polyphase shear zone, um, and that can be applied to any shear zone that has a somewhat consistent protolith. Uh, constant protolith across strike. Uh, and most importantly, all of, all of, that, all of that methodology used to be uh, done by hand using image G, so it was really time consuming. So what I did for this project is I automated most of this process. So I've, uh, by coding it with uh, open source Python package, which I will make available um, on one an online repository soon. So I've, tr I've, I've processed 24 specimens, but I think in a best case scenario, you would work with 100 specimens or a larger amount of specimens. And by using a semi-automated method, it makes it much more, uh, much more time efficient. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. I'm co-supervised by Carl Larson at UBC and Don Kelly at the George Paul Survey of Canada. Uh, I did a lot of the analysis work at the University of Halle with Michael Stipp and Rudiger Kilian. I did the field work with Ricardo and Isabel, which are both grad students at UBC. Isabel uh, recently graduated. And I also had quite a bit of help from Luis Carrego, Jean Luc Pilot from the George College Survey of Canada, and Nicola Gaillard, who graduated from McGill. Uh, I was funded to go to Germany by a German academic exchange scholarship. So that was a great opportunity to make the best out of the pandemic because their universities were open, at least the, the, office, the, the office work. And finally, I'd like to say that everything that I've presented here is very young material. I started interpreting this data only in September. So if you want to discuss about it, and if you have suggestions, I'm more than open to receive it. I didn't write my email here, uh, but I, I've, uh, I've shared it. Um, it. It's actually written in the email on the email list uh, through the invitation to the Zoom meeting. So you're more than welcome to send me an email and start talking with me. I would be very happy to get your feedback. So thanks for your attention.